The US elections are red hot. Donald Trump and Democrat Kamala Harris are virtually tied in all polls. The odds of one candidate or the other winning are basically a coin toss. We already know Donald Trump, a political earthquake who turned his country upside down the last time he became president. Trump advocates tariffs, tax cuts, and is completely in love with the deficit. Now, could you tell me what ideas Kamala Harris advocates beyond raising some taxes? If the answer is no, don't worry. After all, Harris's arrival in the presidential race was practically a last minute accident. And although she's been vice president of the United States for years, the truth is that she wasn't so well known outside the country. But this doesn't mean that Kamala does not have a political program of her own. In fact, the press is already talking about Kamalanomics, the new economic formula with which the White House candidate hopes to make the US richer, reduce inequality, and face the new challenges with China. That said, so far there haven't been many concrete proposals. It's almost as if Kamala's campaign is being as ambiguous as possible in order to scrape votes from everywhere. You know, like the song in the musical Hamilton, talk less, smile more, don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. And of course, all this is not helped by the constant changes of opinion that the presidential candidate has been having lately. To give you just one example, if you ask Kamala what she thinks about fracking, well, she's a big fan, the number one fan. But what did this same candidate say just a few years ago? In Pennsylvania, Harris can't shake her anti-fracking past. Many of the swing voters here whose livelihoods rise and fall with the fortunes of the fossil energy industry have not forgotten the last time Harris ran for president when she called for a ban on fracking. This appears to be a complete change of heart on the part of Kamala Harris. So on Visual Economic, we've looked at the question in depth. And today we're going to tell you what could be the economic policies of the Democratic candidate Kamala Harris. Could she really ruin the American economy as many say? Well, let's take a look. If we're talking about electoral campaigns, there are two points that cannot be missed, taxes and public spending. Let's start with the latter. Kamala Harris has promised to continue many of Joe Biden's programs and reforms, but also to expand them considerably. In fact, this applies to most issues. Many analysts argue that Kamala is a sort of Joe Biden much further to the left. For example, Harris has stated that she wants to orchestrate the largest teacher pay raise ever, raising salaries by $13,500 a year for each teacher. Surely this has nothing to do with the teachers union being one of the party's biggest donors. But on top of this, Harris also wants to give a check of $6,000 for each newborn child while expanding all child related support. And when she says children, she means children up to the age of 18. This is not necessarily a criticism. These types of programs have been very useful in reducing child poverty and the estimated cost is only 0.1% of GDP. What's more, for some reason, Harris has copied one of Donald Trump's most talked about proposals of late, that of eliminating taxes on tips. And well, as expected, Kamala is also proposing to improve public health care programs. Not a lot of details, but given that Joe Biden wanted to expand these programs by taxing people with more than $400,000 in income, and Kamala has talked about $100,000, we can expect a much more aggressive expansion. Thus, public spending policies are as expected. Less taxes and more aid for the middle and lower classes. Many benefits for public workers. And all this with the hope that those paying will be the same as always. The rich. Or at least, the the rich from a marketing standpoint, but let's take a deeper look at who exactly Kamala Harris wants to raise taxes on. Earlier, we said that Kamala wants to raise teachers' salaries. The total cost of this measure alone is $300 million. How is she going to pay for it? Well, her proposal has been to increase the inheritance tax, the famous death tax, which is not very popular in the US. Even so, the star tax policy will be to reverse Donald Trump's corporate tax cut, the largest in US history. With this policy, Trump lowered this tax from 35% to 21%. And if he wins the election, he has promised to lower it further to 15%. Although it remains to be seen if that's true because in his first electoral campaign he also promised to lower its to 15% and he only got halfway there. And let's be clear, the US deficit is so large that it's difficult to believe that he will end up fulfilling this promise. In any case, Trump's tax cut had a very positive impact. Some studies estimate that wages grew by between $500 and $1,000 and GDP increased by an extra 1%, again at the cost of skyrocketing debt. So now Kamala has two choices either lower government spending or raise the tax again to balance the books. So what's the solution? 
for now. Kamala has promised to raise corporate tax 7 percentage points, but has let slip that her ultimate goal is to return to the 35% of the pre-Trump era. In other words, a move that could significantly hurt GDP. As if this were not enough, Harris still has two aces up her sleeve. The first of all is the capital gains tax. That is, the tax on the sale of shares, corporate profits, rental income. The Democratic candidate wants to apply a 25% tax on unrealized capital gains. What does this mean? Well, if you buy some shares and they go up in value in the stock market, but you haven't sold them yet, so far, you don't pay anything. You only pay when you sell your shares for money. But now, Kamala Harris wants to charge benefits that have not yet been realized. What's the big deal, you ask? What difference does it make to pay earlier or later? Well, think about it this way. What happens if the stock goes back down in price before you sell it? Will the states then pay you for the lost profit? This doesn't seem to be the case. Of course, many economists have criticized this measure because it could greatly reduce investment. But guess what? Most likely this measure would be unconstitutional in the US, so I wouldn't worry too much about it either. In fact, the Supreme Court has already struck down a Trump proposal to do something similar, albeit on a much smaller scale. Yes, we already know that Trump is not dazzling for his fondness on the free market either. <laughs> Be that as it may, we don't even know many details of Kamala Harris's proposal. From some comments, it seems that this tax would only apply to a very specific group of people. To the rich? Well, yes, to estates of more than $100 million, but also to another group, the dead. Excuse me, the, the dead? How do you tax a dead person? Well, well, not exactly the deceased. A tax is levied on the assets left behind, even before the inheritance tax. And no, we are not referring to the inheritance tax. Rather, the idea is that in the United States, there is currently no tax on unrealized capital gains when a person dies. That means that if, for example, you make money on stocks and sell them before you die, you pay tax. But if you never sell them, the tax is never implemented. Kamala's idea would be that these profits would be paid for the same even after you die. But it goes even further. Evidence suggests that some people will themselves to survive a bit longer if it will enrich their heirs. To be sure, the evidence is not overwhelming for individuals dying within two weeks of a tax reform. A $10,000 potential tax saving increases the probability of dying in the lower tax regime by 1.6%. To be fair, Harris is not only proposing to increase the tax burden. In fact, she has pledged that no one earning less than $400,000 per year will pay more. And she plans to reduce the tax burden for middle and low income families. However, in Increasing spending so much with the excuse of the rich will pay for it is usually a recipe for disaster. Because yes, the rich may be very rich, but there are so few of them that the total amount collected ends up being small. The question is, will Kamala be able to offset the public accounts? Everything points to no. There's always uncertainty, but it looks like the deficit will go from bad to worse with the candidate. According to one of the most comprehensive studies, government spending under Harris's new election proposals would need 3.5 trillion more than she would be able to raise in new taxes. Although, yes, this figure is still much better than Trump's. Trump has been a public debt maniac, and it looks like he would continue to be. Because believe it or not, the former president has proposed even more government spending and even less taxes. But that's a subject for the next video. The only thing that is clear is that the deficit will continue to accompany the USA for a few more years, which will also worsen inflation. But rest assured that Harris has thought of a policy to lower the cost of living. If things are getting too expensive, Kamala is clear. We simply tell the stores to sell them cheaper. It's as easy as that. You see, for this Democrat, the shopping basket is not too expensive because the country's ultra-expansionary fiscal policy has been rowing against the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. Rather, it's because greedy businessmen are in cahoots to drive up prices and skyrocket their profits. Of course, this doesn't make the slightest sense. Not only are grocery store profit margins much, much lower than other sectors, they have fallen by more than 50% since the pandemic. But we already know that data and politicians have a complicated relationship. To give you an idea, even Paul Krugman, an economist and fervent supporter of the Democratic Party, believes that this is mere populism to win votes and not a real policy. And the worst part is that price controls would not be limited to food stores. Harris has also taken it out on the pharmaceutical sector. 
I'm sure you've heard a thousand times that Big Pharma sells pills for $1,000 that cost $5 to produce, taking advantage of sick people. Well, Kamala has proposed capping the price of insulin at $35 and capping all out-of-pocket medical expenses at $2,000. Well, it's true that drugs in the USA are much more expensive than in many parts of the rest of the world. For example, Ozempic, the miracle drug for weight loss, costs 10 times more in the USA than in Europe. But this is because the US is subsidizing the development of new drugs, and more price controls will mean fewer drugs in the future. Everyone wants the great new pharmaceuticals without paying for them. We need to think more long term. We have much more to gain from a continuing flow of new pharmaceuticals than from lower prices on the last generation. Moving on to healthcare, Kamala Harris wants to eliminate some of the Americans' medical debt. This is a relatively popular policy. Keep in mind that two out of five Americans have medical debt, but medicine is not the only sector in which she wants to reduce costs, nor is it the only one in which she has proposed questionable policies. You can't talk about a 21st century politician without talking about housing. On this channel, we've told you several times how the USA is suffering a serious housing crisis because the bureaucracy makes it almost impossible to build new apartment blocks. For example, there are many neighborhoods where it's illegal to build anything other than a single family house, even if building apartments would allow more people to be housed. And in this matter, Harris has good ideas. She has proposed eliminating red tape, reducing the rights that neighbors have to veto new housing construction in their neighborhood, and obviously used to keep their property values from falling. And she also wants to pass a public spending program to build 3 million new homes. The problem? The problem is that Joe Biden proposed exactly the same thing, and the results were somewhat disappointing. Despite declaring that the solution is to build new housing, most of the work has to be done with unionized workers. So in addition to paying for the new housing, you'll have to pay much higher salaries to the workers, as well as paying for the children, a comprehensive medical insurance. You get the picture. This is why, particularly in democratic majority states, housing construction has lagged far behind, despite all the public spending programs. Simply put, new homes are bottomless money pits. This explains why one of Biden's last proposals before withdrawing from the presidential race was to control rents, prohibiting them from rising more than 5%, which, as we've seen in cities like Berlin and Barcelona, would be an absolute disaster. Kamala Harris will probably keep this proposal, but she has also promised to give a check of $25,000 to families who are buying their first home. The problem? Most likely, this policy will only serve to drive up prices even more. If the problem is that there aren't enough houses for everyone, no matter how much money you give people. They can't buy something that doesn't exist. And insofar as the Democratic leader has declared war on Wall Street speculators, the truth is that they actually own less than 1% of all homes. Now, the war on speculation is not the only one Harris will have to face if she comes to the White House, and certainly not the most important one. There's also the trade war with China. <laughs> Harris has said publicly that she doesn't consider herself a protectionist and has opposed Donald Trump's tariffs. His tariffs would increase the cost of everyday expenses for families. Kamala Harris. Again, this is all well and good, but Biden stated he was also opposed to tariffs and ended up triggering them even more, especially on China. In 2025, it will be up for discussion whether or not to renew the suspension of tariffs on European steel and aluminium that Biden ordered, and Harris will most likely renew them and pursue a friendlier trade policy with Europe than Trump. But it's hard to imagine that she will pursue a similar policy with China. By way of summary, we return to what we told you before. Kamalanomics is still a mystery, but the most likely is a somewhat more radical version of Biden, especially when it comes to taxing the rich. The choice of Tim Waltz as her vice president also seems to point in this direction. We're certainly not talking about a communist, but he does have a more left-wing leaning profile than other candidates who were available. Nevertheless, it's true that the Democrat candidacy in recent days seems to be moderating its position. It no longer talks so much about taxes on unrealized profits and places more emphasis on lowering prices by favoring competition instead of through regulations and subsidies. So by way of summary, we could say that Kamala has a more populist discourse than Biden, that she seems to want to unleash her tax model on the rich, and that all of this could have serious consequences for investment. In any case, I wouldn't be catastrophic either. Although her program is not the best, it doesn't seem to herald the apocalypse either. What is worrying is that a candidate with clear left-wing populist comments and expressions could become president. However, her opponent, as 
far as populism is concerned, does not seem much better either. Frankly, in this election, Americans will have a choice between bad and worse. But having come this far, it's your turn. Do you think Kamala Harris will win the election? Will she follow the same line as Biden, or will she be much more radical than expected? How do you see these policies versus Donald Trump's universal tariff and deficit tax cuts? Which of the two candidates do you think is worse? You can leave me your answers in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it, and I'll see you in the next one. All the best. See you next time.